All right, we're on. Matt McKinnon. Manny, sir. How are you? I'm very, very good, man. So, i um, very excited to have you, man. You have a very fascinating life. And uh, there's a lot of facets to your to your character, to what you do, to what you like to do, to what you're interested in. I'm 10 miles wide and about 2 inches deep. I know a little bit about everything, but not too much about anything. That's uh, th but that's uh, that, that's what's so fascinating about it. Instead of just, this is what I want to do, this is what I like to do, it's... Um, it's uh, almost like that Anthony Bourdain effect of you should experience life. You should experience many facets of life. It makes you a better person, you know. So, dude. So let's start with uh, let's start with uh, with your background a little bit, man. I think that one of the reasons I wanted to get you on is um, you have a very fascinating life as far as your run-ins with law enforcement. Um, oh, we're going right there. We're going we're right going there. Going we're right going there. right there. We're that, not going to ease into this no, at all, are we? No, but. <laughs> Because and I, and I want to bring that up because um, I feel that in a in a society where it's it's easy for people to put labels on mm -hmm. people and it's hard for those people to shake those labels or move past them, um, I think you have a fascinating empowering story where you have actually empowered others. Um, it, most people know you and and for you know for those that don't know, it's like you've owned restaurants, you've managed clubs, um, you're. You're uh, you're part of a multi-million dollar company, you know. We were we were on vacation together, and you're on the phone, and I'm like, "What are you doing?" And you're like, "You're like multi-million dollar deal, baby. Yeah. I can't I can't walk away from this." Right. And uh, and it's all and it's and it's phenomenal. Like I said, that that you were able to move away from from that um, from the stigma of something bad that happened mm -hmm. to you, um, and you continue to grow your character. And I and I find that very empowering, very interesting. I think, like I said. Um, I think that uh, I think people would uh, be very excited to hear that story. Right. So uh, let's let's start with uh, let's start with uh, with the uh, with the background, man. So we, we're not going to mention cities. We're uh, gonna, we're, you know, to protect the innocent. To protect gonna, the innocent. We're, we're, to protect the innocent, we're gonna you know dance around a few things. All right. So yeah. tell us the story. So what were you you were working well in the in the bar. Yeah, so I grew up in a real small town in southern Arizona, and uh, I mean small. I had ninety kids in my class, and after I graduated, I moved up to Tucson. Can we say, can we say the name of that town? The metropolis of Benson, Arizona. Benson, Arizona. It's so small. I <laughs> thought it was tiny. Wilcox. No, no. Crisantos from Wilcox. Crisantos is from Wilcox. Yeah. Which we we went to the Chiricahuas, mm -hmm. and we drove through Wilcox, and that town is either dead or dying. Wilcox? Yeah. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. We'll get back to that. We'll so, get back to that. Yeah. But go ahead. Well, so. I moved to, so I moved to Tucson for the, you know, vision of going to college, which that lasted about a minute. That wasn't, just wasn't for me. Um, while I was here. What were you going to pursue in college? You know, my dad was the uh, administrator of the Benson Hospital for 33 years. Um, he's got a master's degree in healthcare administration. He's got a bachelor's degree in business administration. So that was kind of my you know, goal, I guess, my my vision, I'll go and get a uh, uh, business administration degree and, you know, do something. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it's very hard if you don't know what that something is and being really young and not really having any sort of real passion for anything yet, at least I didn't. How old were you at the time? 18. 18? 18, 18. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So So it's kind of hard to say, you know, when you're sitting there in class and you're sitting there... Why am I going towards? Well, what, yeah. what am I going to do once I once I get done? I'm going to have a degree, and then I can go do what? Right. You know, there was the what was missing, so right. that just it. I you know it couldn't I couldn't didn't hold my interest. Right. Which you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, it just uh, it wasn't that wasn't my path. No, I think I think some motherfucker man that that most people um, are unable to find something to be passionate about. Right. But I think it's also unfair for us to push people into something like, buddy, you're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Yeah. That's a, that's a long time. We're talking about a long time to make a commitment at that, at that age. Sure. You know, I think it's probably going to change. It's probably going to change. It's probably going to change. Your passions will change. Even you might be something, you might be passionate about something during your 20s and your 30s and your 30s you're like you know what this is not my life anymore i've moved yeah. on and and change the hats do something else you know be passionate about something but i think it's unfair 
for people, the way our society is structured for parents, families, um, for for um, for its co colleges to push the concept of you have to get this education, you have to be yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for an education to do something when you haven't figured out your passion. At the end of the day, you might have this degree that means nothing to you because your passion has moved on to be something else. Sure. So no, it's unfair. It, it's, exactly. it's unfair. Yeah, it's exactly. unfair. Exactly. Especially when, you know, you start talking to people and you're you're going to school and you're putting in this time and you're put, you know, doing doing what you're supposed to be do, what you're supposed to be doing. Right. And <clears throat> you know, you talk to a counselor or some sort of uh, guidance type person at the school. And you ask those questions of what happens if I decide I don't want to go into business? You know, I've put all this time in. And their answer is weird. You know, their answer is like, well, then just get a degree in something so you have a college degree. Right. Which, but and at the I'm same like, time, like, like, what, qualifies, what, what, what qualifies that person to be a counselor? You know what I mean? Like, well, right. Like, they, what, they, who are you? What, right. what gives you the qualification to... to Put you in a position to steer the ship of my life. Where is this yeah. going to go? It's a weird position that we go to these counselors for for advice. For advice, I, I well, find I find that very weird, man. Yeah. Because at the same time, at the end of the day, their agenda is retention. Yeah, they're yeah. getting a paycheck to keep you in school as to long as they school. can. Right, where the answer <laughs> might not be that. Yeah. The, the answer yeah. might be, buddy, you need to find out who you are. You right. need to quit school, grab a backpack, travel the world, experience Just life, do something. Do yeah. something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was. I mean, that was that was it. It just didn't. It just didn't work out for me. It just wasn't wasn't my deal. I so, you know, I my first job here in Tucson was I worked at the Sports Authority when it first opened on mm -hmm. Wetmore. It was the very first Sports Authority in Tucson, and I worked in the hunting and fishing camping department because growing up in Benson, Arizona, hunting and fishing and camping was what we did. I mean, that mm -hmm. was that was it. Um, and then I got into the bar business, and that's actually a funny story. A good friend of mine was working at a bar in Tucson, uh, one of our local topless bars. Yeah. Gentlemen's Club. Je je this was a topless bar. It oh. wasn't, there was nothing gentlemen's <laughs> There's about. nothing? Okay. Nah. Oh. And, you know, he, he called me up. Uh, I was at work at Sports Authority, and he said, hey, on your way home, can you bring me some Burger King? I'm starving to death. And he was working. He was working there as a doorman. So I grabbed some Burger King and took it on over there and, you know, went to the front door, and I'm like, you know, I'm... I'm 18 years old. I'm not even supposed to be in this place, you know. And I remember walking in the front door, and there's another doorman standing there, this great big huge guy, and it's kind of like, uh, this is for Jeremy. Well, he's in there somewhere. Go find him. I'm like, okay. Hell yeah. So I'm walking in, and I'm like, oh, my God, look at this. <laughs> you know, people are like, you know, not even really. I don't know. I had this, I had this thought that, you know, you go into a place – I don't know, I want to say like that, you know, just call it a bar in general. Yeah. And you're not old enough to be in there, you know, there was going to be that some you would sort stand of, out. there would be right. some sort of retinal scan to say, right. you know, you shouldn't be in here. No, it was like, you know, what are you doing? I'm bringing my buddy Burger King. Well, go find him. Don't bother me. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I go in and we walked up to the front so we could talk and we're sitting there talking and I'm just like, this is crazy. You know, I can't believe you actually work here, you know, and uh, one of the managers walked up. And you're like, hey, you're six five. And he's it's almost exactly yeah. what it was. He was he was uh, you know, cussing and screaming and I can't believe someone so called in again and I'm firing him and this, that, and the other. He looked at me and goes, Do you want a job? And I said, Well, I how old do you have to be to work here? It was my first question. And he says, I didn't ask you how old you were, I asked if you want a job. And I said, Sure. Wow. And he goes, Okay, you're new you're now my Monday, Wednesday, Friday doorman. Be here Friday night. I'm like, okay. So I got there Friday night. I, you know, I'm here. What do I do? You know, what, right. what, what, what is my Just job? Just stand you know, and look tall. Like stand, look tall. Um, tall and menacing. You know, make sure uh, if anybody acts out, you know, they have to, you get a, you, you know, you get to throw them out and sort of thing like this. But, I, you know, it was, it was where it was very surreal. It was being 18 years old, legally too young to work in the bar. Right. I didn't do paperwork in that bar until I was 19. Right. Okay. So yeah. it was, you know, right away, it's almost like if you talk about foreshadowing in a story or right. <laughs> look at some sort of red flags or the writing on the wall, you know, when your first day of work is, is yeah. we're not doing paperwork until you're about six months older because it's illegal for you to be here. But by the way, go change the keg in the cooler. Oh <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was definitely different. It was, it was, it was a different, it's kind of a different 
Were you were you living by yourself? Or? No, I lived with the guy that that uh, worked there. Okay. The guy brought Burger King too, and then our other roommate eventually worked there as well. So the three of us, the three of us worked there. Yeah, that and is so crazy because whether whether people want to admit it or not, at eighteen, you still have elements of a child in you. Like you, there's yeah. still things where there's still things where. Um, you'll have an experience in uh, good, bad, indifferent, whatever it might be the experience, but uh, you you feel the little innocence die. You you literally oh, feel yeah. that where you're like, yeah. oh man, a piece of my innocence just died. Right. You know, right. and it's uh, and you kind of go home and you feel sad. You know, you're like, I'm gonna watch cartoons to make my feel so feel better. <laughs> right. Because the same thing at 18, I had a couple of jobs that showed me not necessarily like the best parts of humanity, and I remember going home being. You know? Well, you hear that question too. You know, you hear that question. When did you lose your innocence? Right. Well, I know exactly when I lost really? it. Really? You know what I mean? It and, was and just it was right it at, was that just moment. A, at that at that moment where you see just a different. When you see a, I mean, you know, people say things like, you know, the bar business or the nightclub business and this and that. You know, it's kind of, you know, it's a dark world. But is it is it really that bad? You know, I go to a club like that with when my buddy has a bachelor party and we go up there and they put him on stage and they. You know this and that, and you know is it? And everybody's this, happy. Everybody's yeah. happy, and this, that, and the other, and you know it's just it's the entertainment business. It's it's whatever. You know this isn't. Uh, you know it's not really bad. You know it's no different than. You know working at Best Buy. How bad could it be? Well, it's bad. It's bad. I mean, it's it's a very it's a very dark, destructive world. Right, and yeah. you know Tucson, even though we're a small city, you know it's still the wild wild west here, as you being a police officer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, tell me how many calls you had going to a nightclub or a bar or this, that, and the other. You know, I mean, it is. It, it's uh, so it's crazy because that's uh, that's another element where I can count in. I used to be able to count in one hand, but now I have to use a few fingers of my other one. How many times I've been to a strip club, um, and it was mostly out of it's my buddy's bachelor's right. party and. And he's like, God damn it, you're coming. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, dude, I'll go. You know, and I'll go and I'll grab a beer. But being in law enforcement, you get to see what those, you get to see what that place looks like with the lights on mm -hmm. um, before anybody else goes in. You get to see what those people look like at home, you know, mm -hmm. before the black lights and the makeup. Mm -hmm. right. And you get to see who they hang out with. And it's, uh, and it's, uh, I don't want, I don't want him near me. I don't want him touching <laughs> me. And it's, uh, and I'm not talking bad about strippers or you know entertainers, however you want to call them. It's uh, it's but there is a series of decisions that put people in those places, and once you're there, like you said, it's a negative element. It it's is. a negative element because whether you're doing it to pay your way through college, which is crazy amounts of money that they make, mm -hmm. sure. uh, there's also the bad element that wants to get you. Yeah, hooked up into their own vices, mm -hmm. you know. No, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you've heard that saying before. That I don't know if you've heard it or not, but where it says two personalities, two different personalities can actually create a third personality. Mm. There's something that I would never do ever in my mind as long as I live, and there might be something you would never do as long as you could live. But when we get together, we create a third personality that would do it. Right. We'll now take a hundred personalities and put them in where you have Correct. booze, drugs. Sex. I mean, things right. things can go off the rails. Yeah. Um, so you know, I I worked in this club for a couple of years, and I had a little bit of a. I mean, in this world, a pretty good trade. I wasn't a drug addict, and I wasn't a complete disaster, and this and that. So I kind of traveled up the ranks a little bit. I went from, you know, the Monday and Wednesday, Friday doorman to a full time doorman to writing the doorman schedule to becoming an assistant manager, then becoming a uh, the assistant general manager, you know, moving up in a very fairly short period of time, you know, three years, three about three, let's see, yeah, three four years or That's so. Fast, yeah, yeah, and then and then the club closed. Um, it just it was sold, and the new owners bought it, went in a different direction, and so all of a sudden, and it kind of. It kind of came out of the blue. It was like, all right, we have this going on, and now we're for sale, and nothing's going to change. And then we were just sold. Nothing's going to change. And then the new owners come in and say, okay, everything's going to change. <laughs> you guys are gone. I'm bringing wow. in our own crew. So, yeah. you know, then you know, I kind of sat back and had some decisions to make. What you know, what now? You know, do I go back to school? Do I, you know, what do I do? Well, I mean, 
I was making pretty good money in that club world. So when I started the business, I lived in an apartment and drove an old truck and that was it. Now fast forward four years, I own my own house. I've got a couple vehicles. Okay, so now I've got bills. Right. Okay. Responsibility. I've got bills. You're plugged into you know, the I'm machine. Pl- I'm plugged into the machine. Yeah. So, you know, it's give all that up and go back to school or, you know, keep working, keep going, this and that. And so I was kind of trying to make a decision. And then I got approached by a big nightclub company uh, that said, hey, you know, we understand your club closed and you, you know, are you looking for a job? Would you like to come work for us? And this, that, and the other. And, you know, I thought, hey, you know, here we go. Um, So I went to Phoenix, Scottsdale, to run one of their clubs in Scottsdale. And And you're what, 22 about? Yeah, about 22. 22, yeah. yeah. About 18, well, let's see here. 18, 19, 20, 20. Yeah, 22. 22. Right right around there. So I started, you know, as just as a manager sort of thing. And it was it was very similar to the type of environment and whatnot and that I had in Tucson, except it was busier. It was, you know, uh, there was more money coming in. I mean, it was, you know, Mike Tyson would, would be in, uh, Michael Irving. I mean, what year was, was this? So this would have been 1990, 98. Okay, so this is after prison, Mike Tyson. Yes, he was crazy still. Yes, back then. Yes, he'd pull yeah. up. He'd pull up at the club with in his Bentleys and in his Rolls Royce. You know, with his with his soldiers. Yeah, and they'd all go marching up to the VIP section, and uh, yeah, it was what a it, it was crazy it, world, it, it was it was a deal. Yeah. It was, you know, it was a deal. Um, and I was at that in Phoenix, in Scottsdale, for a, not very long until the owners of the club said, hey, uh, we want you to take over one of our big clubs on the East Coast. And now I'm thinking, okay, well, wait a minute now. You know, I'm going to pack up. You know, it was one thing to go from Tucson to Scottsdale, but now I'm going from Scottsdale to the East Coast. Coast. So it's kind of like, you know, do I really want to do this? Do I really, you know, but, but I was in it then. You know, mm-hmm. I was I was in I was you know knee deep in this in this this world you know the money generating world right very and tempting just very oh, tempting. very tempting yeah very tempting especially when you're so young right. you know and there's money and there's good looking girls and there's you know yeah. you can have anything you want you right. know it's almost like money when you walk through the doors in clubs like this almost has no more value people just here here you know things mm-hmm. are just ridiculous. Right. You know, hey, can you get me a drink? And they like, you know, you buy them a free drink and they tip you $100. You know, it's just it's just strange right. how the whole, the, it, it's a subculture, you know. And, it, you know, one thing I've, I'll say, you know, the you know, the gentlemen's clubs and the this and that and the other, you know, in the 80s, they were... They were gentlemen's I mean, they, clubs. They were, well, they, they, were, were, they were glamorous, you know. Right. It was, you know... F- you know, Motley Crue videos and, right. you know, this and that, and it was this. And then as you got into kind of the 90s, the early 90s, um, same sort of thing. And then as you got into later the 90s, it starts, the, yeah, it right. starts to like, and then in the, you know, 2000s, beginning of 2000s, then you it really becomes, it the morphed to something. Belt. Yeah, it morphed I've heard to something that it's, different. I've heard it's because, not that they were not interested in it, but they were just unwilling or unable to stop the criminal element from getting in and either managing or just influencing what the club is going to look like. So yeah. certain clubs belong to certain gangs or they have a strong presence there or they this is where they go and conduct their deals. It's a know? cash, you know, you're looking at a business, it's a cash business. Right. Okay, it's, it's, you know, the amount of cash versus the amount of credit cards that's on paper is it's a huge swing. Right. So anytime you have a cash business that's bringing that much cash, there's the opportunity for undesirables to to want to be involved. To, to in want to be involved, you know, whether whatever whatever their menu of crime is, right. you know, cash, cold hard cash that can actually be untraceable is it's appealing, right. you know. So yeah, and. You know, if I'm a criminal and I go into a bar and I'm sitting there doing whatever I'm doing, negotiating something, selling something, buying something, whatever, you tend to fit in with everybody else that's sitting right. there. You you're, don't stand, not, you don't stand the out. The clubs right. are dark, the, you know, the clubs, and if I go in there and spend a lot of money, 
you know. Right. And I'm the girls be, and the works are working with you too because they're you're probably feeding them free drugs too. So well, they're yeah, yeah. What, whether whatever the poison yeah. is, so you they're, know, I mean, yeah, it's, so they're it's, watching out you're, for you're, the guy that's a cop. You're or, definitely paying the rent. Yeah, <laughs> you're, they're rent. Right. You know what I mean? So you know, it, it, when I was when I went to the East Coast, and you know, I'm running this club. This club was huge. I mean, it was twenty three thousand square feet. It Jesus. was um, two stories. Uh, there was glass elevators that went up to the second story. Um, yeah. um, lots of athletes. Lots of Lots of bigwigs, lots of people, actors, right. you know, whatnot, I mean, would come in. And this was still in the era of it being glamorous. Right. You know. What um, would be the, if you if you can remember, just so we get a, so we get a, our grasp on the money that we're talking about, in a week, what are you talking um, about as far as the amount of money coming in? Or could you even remember, like, maybe, like, in a day? What's the uh, amount, what's the largest amount of money that you handled well, that I handled, I mean, we had a safe in this place that was the size of my truck. And, um, you know, you had to have, not only did you have the money that, you know, maybe you made the night before and you haven't gone to the bank yet and this and that, the change aspect of this was huge. Okay. Okay, you have to have change. Right. You know, to get through a 14-hour day. Right. Okay. Is that how long the club was open? 14 oh, hours? Yeah, it was safe. They opened at 11 and closed at uh, 3 in the morning. Jesus. I mean, I don't know how yeah. long that is. Mm. So it's open. So you've got to have ones and fives. Right. <laughs> got to have your ones and fives. So there's at any given time, I mean, at the big clubs, um, 25000 in, 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 in ones and fives. Yeah. Plus whatever you did the night before, which could be fifty grand. Oh um, yeah. Um, daily. Daily, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's and then, you know, crazy. if you have an event, if you have a sporting event going on in the area and maybe you have, you know, the – the local baseball team's home opener and, you know, right. and this and that, yeah, it can be more. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of cash. I it's mean, crazy. It is. So, you know, I, w I was working there and I'm working for a company and, you know, the company I'm working for, there was, you know, you, you, you see some of that shadiness. You see some of that, this is probably not the best environment for me. Mm -hmm. And that's right about, right about that time. I started thinking, okay, what's what's the exit strategy? There's got to be an exit strategy because I can't do this for the rest of my life. You right. Know? Um, and I wish that I would have had that uh, little voice in my head, that strategy, a little sooner. But uh, you know, it just didn't it just didn't work out that way. So was it just that it was comfortable to stay because how much money you were making? Yeah, it's comfortable to stay. Yeah. This and that. You got the feeling that you worked for a company that you know took took care of you, mm. sort of thing. You know, right. they knew. And again, you know, I wasn't a drug addict. I wasn't a drunk, I, you know, in that world, that personality itself is a commodity because you get a manager or somebody that comes in that runs a place who's, who's a mess, you know, it's going to affect the business of, right. the, of, of the club. So, you know, it's the, the, the club owners look for a very specific person. They look for somebody that's not a altar boy, right. but not a rock star drug addict. Right. Throwing chairs out of hotel room windows. You know what I mean? Correct. They look for yeah. that. Where is that? We got to find that happy medium right. where there's somebody that can come into my club and create a party every night, but you know we know it's not going to disappear for three days. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, operators like myself were were a commodity, and we were we were liked and we were taken care of. Yeah. Um, my run in that you mentioned. You know my my. The, the the turning point of the story sort of thing, you know. Um, it, up until now, you know, it was kind of like, um, you know, because I had a good family growing up. I had a, I had a great childhood. I I, you know, was what I felt a good person. So you kind of look at the environment you're in, and I was able to like separate myself and say, well, this isn't really me. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be in here doing this. That's not really me. The problem is. Well, yeah, it is you. If you're involved in this, yeah, you're, you're one of the cogs in the wheel here. You know, you can't mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm just going to do this right now. You're not putting on an act, okay? No, you're, you're in it. You're running clubs. You're, you're, you know, managing the chaos. And that's what it was like on a busy, busy night. I mean, you know, there were so many people in there, and there's so many. I mean, we would have 100 
girls working a night, 100 girls, okay? You have chaos going around here, and all you can really do is control the chaos control, on the outside. Right. And boy, oh boy, you don't even want to know what's going on in the center. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But, right. you know, you're kind of controlling everything, and you're, you've created that. You know, you've, you've made that happen. So you're responsible for what's going on in that bubble. So <clears throat> one particular night, I was up in the office, and it was towards the end of the night, and I was counting money. We had a group of football players that were in the club um, from a local college, and I had kind of heard the rumblings earlier that, yeah, these guys are a little out of hand and this and that. We might have to ask them to leave and, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, but I was up in the office, I'm upstairs, and then the front door hostess calls me and says, hey, you better come down here. There's going to be a fight. Okay, now I'm sitting, so the office, you had an outer office where there was couches, chairs, desk, manager stuff, you know, hang your jacket, all this business. Then you had the inner office, which was like the count room where the money was and this, that, and the other. Well, it wasn't uncommon, and this had actually happened in the area several times, it wasn't uncommon where somebody would start a fight or a distraction or something. To rob. And then... Huh. You know, the manager comes sprinting out of the office, right. runs down the stairs while someone runs right back up the stairs, opens the door, and grabs cash. You know, that was not unheard of. So they're telling me there's going to be a fight. I intercommed back and said, okay, grab one of the floor managers. And now I'm taking money and I'm shoving it in the safe because if I'm going to leave, you know, I need to get everything secured. And that was one of the policies of the, of the club. You know, you never leave money out. You never, you know, you keep everything secured right. and this and that. So... By the time I got that all done, which took a second, and got downstairs, I got down to an empty lobby. And I'm like, well, where, where is everybody in there? There was nobody up there. And one of the waitresses who was kind of standing there like pointed and said, they're, they're outside. So I go outside, I open the door, I walk outside, and um, there's just a melee going on fight. I mean, just, there's, I don't even know how many of the guys that, the, the bad guys. Just a if you brawl will. in the parking lot. Oh, just a brawl. Just absolutely. And so I'm kind of trying to process this of right. what, you know, where do you start sort of thing. What do I do? What's what my do role do? in this? Right. right. Yeah. So I actually turned back in and screamed up at the front from the call, the police, call 911. Right. And the hostess that was up there said, I already did. Already, already called. Right. So when I kind of focused my attention back, there was a valet parker that worked for us that was just getting beaten. I mean, just, and this guy was no threat to anybody, you know? Right. And I, I don't know if he tried to break it up and got involved or if how exactly he got involved, but he's getting just pummeled by several people. Right. And I grabbed one of the guys that was on him and pulled him off and him and I get into a tussling match. Well, I picked him up, I threw him down on the ground. And when I did, Immediately, I said, shit, because his head bounced off the curb very violently. Ooh. Yeah. And, you know, I've done talks with uh, Dorman, with uh, club owners, um, done sales consulting for restaurants and nightclubs in my kind of career afterwards, and we'll kind of get onto that, you know, and it's like I always talk about that experience because, you know, that moment of picking the guy up, throwing him on the ground to try and diffuse this situation that's going on, in that split second, it changed my life. Wow. It changed his life. Okay. People, and so the Superman effect of alcohol, people don't understand how frail the human body is. You're right. And what... One punch, one bad fall, right, um, right. What it'll do your body and how it can change your life for the rest of your life you from know, that moment. And but I think it was it's more I think it's more prevalent in like smaller towns with like not where it's more of a violent life, not so much like a safety net. Growing up in a in in a, in, in Mexico in a wild city, mm -hmm. it wasn't. It wasn't weird to see somebody with a with a 
dead arm uh, with the you know and then you talk to them they're like it's a bad fall it was in a right. fight it was a bad fall this person was normal one bad punch one bad now punch. they're not you know they're not all there and it's you know it's funny it's when you when somebody experiences something you know and this is where the uh, PTSD yeah. okay with soldiers and this and that you know if if you grew up in a rough city right okay so from a very early age you saw injuries you saw bodies. bites probably yeah. you saw bodies, bodies you right, saw this yeah. so at a very early age your brain had slots that it would slide in what you saw mm -hmm. right yeah so then transition you to a police officer you saw fights you saw bodies you saw you know this and that and when you saw it your brain took that image okay I'm gonna file that in the dead body slot right you had one yeah. you had that slot you know what right. I mean yeah it's when when Somebody have account, encounters something and they don't have that slot, right. and they see something, and that's what happens is that image or that that experience floats around in their brain, looking for a place to file it and put it to rest, and they do not have a place to file it because that experience doesn't fit into who they are. Correct. It's it's Correct. such a foreign experience. I recall the sound of a of a thud like the head you know mm -hmm. of either me getting hit or hitting somebody and you're right with it's that the sound like the ocean moment of the mm -hmm. head bouncing it's a certain sound you can't it's mistake a certain it. sound you can't mistake but, it but it's not a sound that ever goes away like no. that's still here no I was yeah. talking to a good friend of mine's son and his friends who they were high school kids uh, they were kind of getting into scraps and this and that and fights and and you know I was talking to them and I said, hey, you, you, you need to realize something here, that when a, when a fight happens, okay, a, a lot, there, it's not under control and a lot can happen. You know, somebody can get hurt and one of the kids said, well, I'm not worried about getting hurt. And I go, I'm not talking about you, okay? Right. I'm talking about the other guy, yeah. okay? What, you know? Okay, so you get into it with somebody and you get the better of them, and you're now the tough guy at, you know, Rincon High School or whatever, and don't mess with so and so because at the party on Saturday he, you know, punched Johnny Joho in the face. You know what right. I mean? And boy, that's that guy's a badass, and you know this and that. And you get your you get your rep, and you get your you know you get to go through and okay, now I'm a yeah. I'm a tough guy. But okay. what happens when it goes okay. beyond that? What happens yeah. when it goes beyond that? You know we. When you hear, you get a group of guys together. If you get a group of guys together and they start telling stories, at one point those stories are going to turn into, remember the time we got in the fight, you fill in the blank. Right? right? Yeah. Always. Okay? Yeah. It doesn't matter who it is. Which, you know, it's fine. You know, it's stories and remembering and this and that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good. But very, very small percentage of those people that when they get to, together and they tell their story, that that story ended with someone accidentally getting killed, getting handicapped, and you go to jail. Right. That'd be a whole different story, right? You yeah. Know, like very, very, very few. Very different outcome. Very few. It's a right. very different outcome. So, you know, with, with me, and, and the reason I tell my story and don't have a problem telling my story is that it really, it, you know, defined my life. My experiences defined my life. It made me who I am. Right. Okay. Right, wrong, indifferent. It made me who I am. It made me how I am as a father, how I am as a significant other, how I am as uh, a businessman, you know, how I am just generally out in the world with, with people. So this evening, this, this incident, you know, the guy hits the ground, his head bounces off the ground. I said, Shit. Shit. Not good, right? And it was not good. Mm. He was hurt very, very badly. And come to find out, he was the son of a very high-ranking police officer in the city police department. Right. Um, now, but, we're not going to say the name of no. the city, but one thing that is very important part of the story is this is an old city. Old money. With an old, old police department. And there were, there were, I, I had witnessed, um, we used to go to this after hours bar. It was all the service industry people when you would, uh, you know, you'd work your shift, the bars closed at 3 a.m., you'd get everything uh, 
put away and this and that, lock the doors, everybody jump in their cars. This is in the middle of a big city. You'd go down to basically uh, a speakeasy, you know, an after yeah. hours place where you go in, you could have breakfast. Um, it was operating as a bar. I mean, you walk in there, you'd think it was 11 o'clock on a Friday night. It was right. just, it was absolutely packed. And we'd sit in there and drink till the sun came up and, you know, and this, that, and the other. And it was not uncommon to watch fully uniformed police officers walk in, walk up to the uh, bar, have the owner shake their hand, the owner open the register, pull out some cash, there you go. There they do a shot of Jaeger because it was the middle of the winter and it was two degrees outside and then out the door and we'll see you tomorrow. I mean, right. it was, you know, there was, we, I had experienced as, even as far as, you know, seeing police officers on the payroll for certain pieces where they actually got a paycheck. Right. They got a paycheck for off duty security work that they never showed up for. Right. There was no off duty security work. You know what I mean? Right. But they got yeah. paid paid for it, you know. So right. so that kind of adds to this situation I was in. It's yeah. not like I was standing outside of Walmart and I get into it with somebody and the person cracks their head open and then the police come and then I tell my side of the story and then the witnesses tell their no, maybe was... maybe I get a court date and maybe I sit in front of a judge and say, Look, it was a self defense situation. Right. You know, all that, how it should work. Right. That's how it not, should work. Not this that's one. How, not that's this how, one. This is the son of work. a high ranking commander. They're coming after you. Correct. And you know, they came in force that night. And this guy goes away in the ambulance. And they scoured the place looking for the person who did this. And at the time, all of the employees, um, my employees, you know, this, that, and the other, uh, they were they were honestly they weren't even quite sure right then who exactly did it. There was too much chaos going right. on. You know, they couldn't say, "Oh, well, he did it." Mm -hmm. No, they couldn't really tell. They're like, "I don't know." You know, there was a fight because everybody was hitting everybody how this specific guy got hurt this bad is kind of an unknown I you know we, we don't know um, now I didn't talk to the police that night I didn't talk to anybody because I was hiding <laughs> all right plain and simple and I'll tell you why I had gone upstairs into the office when the police arrived along with this person's father and I wish I could well I, I hear it it echoes in my head listening to the yelling and screaming going on between my manager partner and the police down there that you know the words exactly you know I can paraphrase but for the most part you know it's who did this okay and they're coming with us and it wasn't they're coming with us to go get fingerprinted and booked into the county jail it was they're coming with us and <laughs> You know, I mean, who knows? I mean, who knows? Who, who, right. you know, this could, yeah, who knows? Yeah. So there was no way in hell I was going to talk to these people. And the next day, the people I worked for, you know, and I explained this, uh, there wasn't much support there. You know, mm -hmm. nothing. They didn't want to bring attention or heat onto the club. Right. Which at first... I was kind of well. Why aren't they? Why aren't they helping me out? Why aren't they backing me up? I made these people a lot of money. Why? Why am I not, you know, part of the group anymore? Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out, the club was doing things they shouldn't have been doing. Um, there was actually a manager that worked for the club that was a uh, federal agent. Come to find out, mm. and there was an investigation going on in a different state with the owners of this club, and I just happened to, and I didn't know about any of this at the time, but. It was, you know, they were kind of like, oh, you did something you shouldn't have? Okay, we'll see you later. You're on you your can own. go on down the road. You're on your own. Go get your own attorney. Right. So I came back to Arizona and just up and left and was back here for about six months. And then I got indicted. And in that six-month time, they had convened a grand jury and grabbed all the male employees of the club who all still live there um, pulled them you know into a deposition and basically said we are going to charge you with attempted murder um, who did this <laughs> Matt McKinnon wow. Matt McKinnon Matt McKinnon just round the table here we right. go everybody now the guy day. you were because defending changed the story he did he you know at first 
when I saw him the first time I went back, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but when yeah. I first bat, went back for a pre-trial, um, he was like, hey, man, I got you. You know, man, if it right. wasn't for you, I would have been beaten to death and this, that, and the other. Well, that's fine and dandy, but they hit everybody with what they call a shotgun indictment, which means right. they indicted everybody. Everybody. Everybody right. and charged everybody with the same, same thing. Right. Him included. Okay, him included. And he had an attorney who said, Fuck that. Hey, Throw this fuck, dude under the bus, fuck, yeah. Yeah, look, did you do anything? No, I got beaten up. Then why are you even thinking about staring at these charges? Yeah, well, the guy was helping me. You, you're, you're, you're being charged with the same thing that he is. Did you do anything? No. Okay. So hmm. he said that, uh, uh, he actually said that, and, you know, you know, is this, is this, you know, there's no honor among thieves sort of thing. But, you know, he, he you, you, you look at, and as a police officer, you, you know, you kind of look, all right, did the act, was it proportionate to the threat? Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And they posed this to this guy, you know. Here's the guy that got hurt. Here's what's wrong with him. Here's what he's going to have to deal with with the rest of his life. Was the act of you getting, the threat of you getting beat up and this person coming to your, to your, you know, your rescue, was that proportionate to what this guy got? Did he deserve that? And they got him to say, no, he didn't wow. deserve that. Wow. It wasn't that bad. Okay, so, you know. I had hired an attorney. I had spent a lot of money on it. My parents spent a lot of money that they didn't have. Um, you know, I sold my truck. I, I, you know, did scraped and borrowed for, you know, these payments for these attorneys are just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. You know, and the whole time, you know, the attorney is saying, hey, you didn't do anything, Matt. We're fine. You didn't do anything. He kept saying that. And I'm trying to tell him, well, I did do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I did, you know, the guy got hurt and I'm the one that hurt him. Right. Okay. Did I intend to hurt him like this? No, of course not. But it's it's the uncertainty but of a fight. It's, it's the uncertainty right. of a fight, and it things it's one of the happen. things that drives me absolutely nuts. What we were just saying, you know, you get around a group of males between a certain age, and they have a couple beers, and everybody wants to talk about the fight they got in. Mm. You know, where I just want to distance myself from that. Right. And I don't want to chime in and 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 say, oh, well, I remember this one time I was working at the bar, and this guy, yeah. da, 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 you know what I mean? Because you know, for me, it went bad, right. you know, and that, and you, you know, I, I, I say when I entered that line of work, I lost my innocence. Well, when the second that guy's head bounced off the ground, I became a man. Okay? Right. You're fa you were facing some real I, I life facing, consequences. I was facing to, for the rest of my life. Right. But that's it. You know, so that's the that's the interesting thing about the stories, right? Because you and I have been around those people that love to tell stories about themselves, like how good they are, how strong they are, how their gods give to like fighting because of mm -hmm. this happened or that happened. One thing that those people live out is the consequences of their actions. Sure. We never sure. talk about what happened as a result of that fight. Correct. You know. Correct. And, and like I said, nine times out right. of ten, maybe nothing happened. But it, you, but it's also know. like what do we consider a fight? You know, it's something that's funny in law <laughs> enforcement, is that you you hear the special like the young guys come in and they're they're talking about like got in a fight, and uh, and I was like no you didn't. <laughs> the guy pulled away, you guys tussled for a little bit. He stiffened up his arms. You cranked his arms behind his back. Right. You know he might have like swung at you once and then he was protesting. He didn't want to go down without letting you know that this sure how displeased he was with this happening to him. But that wasn't a fight, you mm -hmm. know? And I think a lot of those times people say, I got in a fight. No, you guys swung at each other, might have hit each other once or twice, and then it got broken up. Yeah. Or people ran away. Or more mm -hmm. people jumped in and turned to a melee. That's not a fight, per se. Mm -hmm. It was, you guys tussled. You sure. Know? It was It was cute. Sure. I've been in fights where the guy, where you're, you have to take the guy into, into jail, and the guy goes... I'm not going. I'm not going to jail. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, and it's it is one of those moments where you wish that, you know, you had a gentleman shot where you're like, all right, we're doing yeah. this. Shots. Ready? Yeah. Because it was like that. Like, he's not going and you, you're going. And 
he ended up going, but it was a fight. It was a fight. It was a fight. It was. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a really good point. And uh, you know, the same thing when you run into somebody and they're like, "Yeah, we went to, you know, we went to the bar. This is my favorite. We went to the bar and uh, we got thrown out. The, the doorman threw us out. You know, right. you know, I've seen thrown out, thrown out, and right. I've seen bad thrown out. And this, I'm not talking. I'm talking the big city, right? Okay? And where you got to squirt it out, it just, and then you did, mm, no, yeah, you did that, right, right. There's that, and yeah. then there's, yeah, it got thrown out, and the helicopter showed up, and there's one guy laying there in handcuffs, and you got doormen that are missing teeth, and you know, <laughs> right. got their eyes scratched, you know, and Jeez. sort of, I mean, just like, you know, but it goes back to what we were talking about with processing those things. The longer I was in that business the more slots I started developing in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I could process it. Right. You know, oh, yeah. a guy got cracked in the head and his eyeball fell there, out. There okay, I got now. a slot for that. Bam. Right. You know what I mean? Or this happened, I got a slot for that. You know? So the problem with that, you know, is fast forward to this great, big, huge fight. You know, I walk outside, there's a giant melee going on. Okay, well, my brain is putting this, everything. Okay, that guy's getting beaten up over there. Oop, that goes into that slot. That guy's knocked unconscious. That's going in that slot. You know, and you get to, you, you actually, on the surface, you're staying calm and cool mm -hmm. because your brain's not trying to process what's going on. And I'm sure it's like that with a police officer. You walk in to a scene that's just horrific and you've been there before. You can say, okay, you know, let's look at this whole thing going on and kind of determine all right, who's my suspects, who's my victims, you know, this, that, and the other, where I imagine a guy like you, it'd be completely different for a rookie who walks in and goes, holy shit, there's blood on the floor. Right. You know, you, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So, you know, that was, that was, you kind of become desensitized, you know, or I became desensitized. So, you know, the long and the short of it with the, with the, uh, did you go to trial? Did you go to trial? I, well, I, no, I took a plea bargain to not go to trial. I did two years of, two years of pretrials. So I flew from Arizona back east every few months for two years. Wow. Okay, because a lot of times I had to be in court um, in case a deal came out on the table. Now, the motivation of the person that got hurt was purely money, mm -hmm. purely money. He could care less about me. He wanted to sue the club. He right. wanted to sue that company for big dollars. Absolutely, there's big pockets there's, involved There's now. deep right. pockets there. He wants to sue them. And if I am convicted of a crime, it makes his case wild yeah, much more so. Right? right? Yeah. So this was fought out in court, back and forth. And one by one, each one of the other people that worked at the club got, you know, dismissed, you know, took a probation, did something to get out of there. And at the end of this whole thing, it was just, you know, me. And it was funny, little side tidbit. One of the pretrials that, um, that uh, I had to be at was I was getting ready to get on an airplane and they were like, you know, this is it. This could be the, this could be the, uh, the last trip, the, the last trip. This one, they're probably going to offer you a deal. They're going to do something. This could be absolutely everything. And I'm on the airplane, I'm sitting at the airport, this, that, the other, and all of a sudden, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, loudspeaker goes off that all flights have been canceled and this and that and you know what the hell's going on and this you know so I call uh, the people I was working for at the time and said hey I guess I'm gonna come back to work and my flights got canceled and I'm trying to get a hold of the attorney to go I'm not gonna be able to make it I don't know what's going on well it was uh, September 11 2001 oh, <laughs> It's when, yeah. <laughs> so you know. Needless to say, no, I didn't have to fly anywhere for right. a while. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. was it like a week? Jeez. Was it like a week? Yeah, I think I think it was. Yeah, you it know? was so crazy. I'm gonna look up, and I think that's when you realize that how used to the normality of seeing an airplane, the sound, the you know, sound, yeah. The it was so weird for like like I said for like those three to four days where it was like. Yeah, you know, if I it's know. not government related, there's nothing, there's there's nothing no, in the sky. There's no, it's, yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah crazy. It's weird, man. So, I mean, in the end, um, you know, I, I took a I took a plea deal, um, so I didn't have to uh, do any time. Do any or time. Trial. No, I had to stay in kind of a work facility for a while and do some work loading right. semi trucks and this and that in like a camp type environment. Um, 
but you know it was it was done it was one of those things where it was like okay here's the deal now my parents were extremely supportive during this whole thing and I mean extremely supportive you know and my dad you know I'm sitting in court or at the courthouse not in court they said we're gonna do jury selection this is gonna become a jury trial and my attorney said I'm gonna go at him with one last deal to see if they'll take it and I'm talking to my dad on the phone and I'm like they're gonna my attorney's gonna see if you know they'll offer me one more deal and my dad said son do not plead yourself into prison do not take a plea deal that involves going to prison don't do it mm -hmm. if you're gonna go to prison then get in that jury trial you tell your story right. and you know, see what happens, but don't 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 plead yourself don't into, plead a, yourself into prison. In prison. Right, right. So I told my attorney that I'm not doing that. Anything I do has got to be prison free. So we came up with a uh, with a um, a deal. I pled guilty to aggravated assault, and um, and it was over. You know, yeah. it was it was the the two year stretch stress was over. Right. Okay. What was that first night when that chapter was done? I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. You know, of course, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, well, I've got to remain here for a few months to do my sentence and this and that, but mm -hmm. for the most part, I'm not going to prison. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it was a little short lived because then when reality started hitting in, I'm like, okay, well, I work in the restaurant business, I work in the nightclub business. Um, you know, I have to hold certain licenses, mm -hmm. okay? I hold certain licenses in the restaurant world that you can't hold if yeah, you have a record. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so all that's going around in my head. Well, what am I now? What do I do? Right. You know, am I going to be able to get back in this world? And am I, you know, how is this going to work? So, ended up coming back to Tucson when it was all done and started working for a restaurant group here and um, uh, was a manager. Was just a you know regular manager. Which did they was know crazy. about your record? Or did they come I, you up? You know, or? I did because to get a job they had to do a background check. Right. And, um, you know, they said, we have to do a background check, and is there anything you need to tell us? Well, yeah, one <laughs> thing we could talk about real quick here. Yeah. You know, but I was, and I ended up, well, I'll tell you this in a second, kind of when I started teaching these things. Um, I, I really spun it or fine-tuned it to, here be an example, you know, have you, have you ever been arrested, convicted, this, that, and the other? Well, look. Yes, I did have I did have a problem. It was a fight I got into. It was an assault charge. I wasn't on drugs. I've never been convicted of drugs. I've never stolen. It, it had nothing to do with theft. It had nothing, you know. So you kind of all the all it was right. all the all the red the sure, marks. Sure, yes, was, there's right. a problem. Here's the problem specifically. Right. Here's the problem, but it didn't but it have theft, to do it was with right. all of this, you know. So I took the job. I got the job, you know, and that was kind of like the first. I mean, talk about nerve wracking. You know, I'm sitting there going, "Man, I got to go in there and sell myself to these people." And I don't know how many other people are interviewing for this position, but right. I'll tell you what, I'm at a disadvantage because. Right. So, know, what was your thought process? So, you come out of this, you're, you, uh, you do your, you do your sentencing, you did your, uh, your, um, your community service or whatever you want to call it. The thought process were like, okay, now you're going to reintegrate back into the world. You're going to get a job, um, but now there's there's a label hanging. There's a label. Over, there's a label hanging there's over. There's a couple. Ha there's a couple labels now. Right. So, okay. what? How do you shake that off? Because most people don't. I spun it into a positive. When I did the interview, who helped you? They, Was there something that helped you figure out how to spin into a positive? The spinning part I did by myself. There was what was that person, thought process like? Well, there was first there was a person that um, uh, it became a dear friend, and I was working for him in Tucson in his little bar, and this was the first job I had when I got back, and I was bartending, and, and it was a little tiny Italian restaurant, and um, we a lot of times we were slow, there wasn't people there. He would sit there and uh, and we'd talk and this and that. And one day he said, you know, what what are you doing here? I said, well. I'm bartending I opened up today you know, right it's Thursday I you know he goes no I mean what are you doing here it, it, you you don't belong here he says I love it I love it I can go home anytime I want I know the place is going to be secure in and good great hands, right? and in good hands but what are you doing here wow. you should be you know he said you know what you need to do 
you need to pick a place you want to work and you need to go in there and tell them I want to work here and I would do a good job working here and this is the only place I want to work and here's why I would do a good job so I did I did I went in and I said yeah look do I have something here you asked me about this hanging over my head yes I do however look I've ran places that were three times the size of any of your restaurants in your chain okay I could manage under these certain conditions of things going on and this that and the other a lot more complicated a lot more hectic a lot more factors you know if all I got to deal with here is a small bar crowd that's listening to the Tucson Jazz Society and uh, making sure that the steak comes out medium well I'm good right. you know what I mean yeah. and um, and I sold myself I mean I plain sold myself I right. you know I sat in the car looking in the rearview mirror practicing what I was going to say and watching the expressions on my face to practice talking to someone mm -hmm. and went in and you know and did it and sold yourself and, and yeah. sold myself so that was that was the, like the first obstacle we knocked it down right. we knocked it down I'm in the I'm you know I'm you're back, back in you're I'm back, back in you're I'm plugged back in. you know yeah. um, so that went very well and I worked um, with that company for several years and then was approached by a group that wanted to open uh, Sam Hughes place championship dining um, champs as it was labeled by mm -hmm. the college kids on Six and Campbell you know and they came and said hey look we're looking to open just this off the wall off the chart sports bar down by the university um, state-of-the-art TVs just the whole thing we want you to come in be our partner run it you know and I'm like oh my gosh this is this is a dream come true right now I got to tell this group what happened right here we go again you know because as we're talking about putting the restaurant together and what's going to happen with you know the menu and this that yeah it keeps coming back well we want you to hold the liquor license Mm -hmm. Okay, now the way the liquor license works in the state of Arizona is you have to be free of arrest for five years to even apply. Wow. And if you have a record, you have to jump through, I mean the hoops you have to jump through are ridiculous. And then it goes in front of the city council. You get to sit up there in front of the city council and have the neighbors because it's all public record, right? sit there and go, we don't want that guy running a bar in our neighborhood. Wow. And we're dealing with the historic Sam Hughes neighborhood. It can be a little pretentious. Right. right. Okay. So, but I did, you know, I told him, I said, look, I was involved with something. I, I, I have a past. Um, you know, I've worked and ran several restaurants after the fact. And, you know, I've never had an incident since. Um, this was something that happened in my life that I'm not proud of, but it happened, and this and that. And in the end of the day, okay, right. let's do it. Really? Let's open the restaurant. Yeah. Let's do it. So, there's my second block that I was able to, you know, get past. Right. And then there was the liquor board, okay, writing essays and sending in copies of the police reports and there because you can say all day you can say anything you want you know what do you think is what is on the police what's on the police report? report yeah here's what happened yeah we don't care what happened what let me see the police report we'll right. tell you what happened now you know? let's talk about the police report is okay it an accurate police report um no 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 okay uh -uh. the police report read um the police report basically said that I threw someone on the ground and began kicking them repeatedly and there was trauma to the guy's head oh my God. okay which is not what happened right at all right I don't even know where the kicking came from but that's not right <clears throat> that didn't happen and there's no there were no police report supplements that pointed to the contrary saying this is what this person is saying but we found no no, no. If I no evidence of this. This is the police report said this is what happened. This is what happened. And then, of course, when I, well, I kind of left a part out. So after I was done with the criminal portion of this, the civil suit came. Right. Okay. Of course. The, the lawsuit. So I didn't get sued personally because I didn't have anything, but the club got sued. So I was a witness for the club. Huh. See? Um, <clears throat> so. I'm a witness for the club, and then of course, you know, they bring into court the pictures. Here's this guy, here's the head trauma he dealt with, here's what he's got to deal with for the rest of his life, 
you know, this, that, and the other. So what was on the police report could very well match up with the pictures and what happened. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Where they couldn't, you know, there was no expert that came in, well, that didn't happen when, right. this, you know, this is, everybody was convinced this is exactly what happened, which, okay. So went through the process with the liquor board in Arizona. We actually came up with a contingency, uh, a little backup plan. If Matt doesn't get a liquor license for the restaurant, what do we do? So we came up with uh, we came up with another plan, another another idea, and but uh, it was approved. Uh, you got it. I got it. In yeah, and uh, everything was everything was fine. I mean, we moved moved forward. Another block. roadblock number three knocked down. Right, and then over the course of 2005 to 2012, 13, um, I had four restaurants eventually. Uh, we just kept opening restaurants and, and, you know, I was the license holder on each one and had to go, funny enough, I had to go through that same process with the liquor board each time because it's like a new application and a new sort of thing, right. you know, but now my brain now had a slot to file what happens when you got to go up in front of the liquor board and the city council or, you know, right. Pima County Board of Supervisors and plead your case of why you would be a responsible license holder. And now you have a record of being responsible. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, right. you had an opportunity to prove your character beyond that experience, mm -hmm. beyond that incident. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so you, know, you, go through the first, you go through the first one and you're about to walk into a city council meeting. You know, my hands were shaking. I was sweating. I, I you know, was like, I can't get through this. This is, this is everything. Well, then you do it four times. Your brain has that slot that files going in front of the, you know, whatever. You know, you walk in calm and cool and, and, and you know, Phenomenal. here's what I've done in this net. So during this time of running with the restaurants and this, you know, this, this part of, you know, my experience, um, a gentleman came into one of the restaurants and he asked me if I would be interested in speaking and teaching a resume writing class at the federal prison. And I'm like, I love this story, by the way. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Okay, great. We're going to send over an FBI background check form. You got to fill that out. Well, here uh, we here go we again. Go. Here we go again. We got to have a talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to pass. You know, I went through the whole thing. And at, at, at the time, it was kind of like handshake. Oh, well, thank you very much. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, wish you could have done it. And then what happened behind the scenes, okay, because he came back to me um, probably a month later. But what was going on in that month is he was the director of education for the uh, uh, Federal Prison Bureau, Bureau of Prisons. He went back and talked to his colleagues who talked to the warden, who talked to the director of uh, the big boss of education and this, that, and the other. And they, they, you know, they said, well, what better person to talk to these Guys, it's gotta be relatable. That, it's gotta yeah. be relatable, and I and that this what I this why I love the story is because if you're gonna if you're gonna tell somebody that they can get past that label sure. that right. is now on them, you are a convicted felon. You're doing time, and you're gonna be like time. that for the rest of your life. Right. Why would I get out of prison and do anything good? Right. But if but if you can have somebody that can say, listen, you can shake that label mm -hmm. off, and you can. You can redefine who you are. Don't let this experience determine who you're going to be for the rest right. of your life. Who better than somebody like you? Yeah. You know, so. Well, you know, um, they, they approved it. They yeah. came back and they said, he's still got to do the background check. We have to make sure that what he is saying has happened is right. what comes up on the background check. Right. And um, if that happens, we want him to come in and do it. Talk to the inmates. Yeah. So, but I love the reaction of the inmates because that again, it, it's so at it's, it's first, so funny because people people talk about what do you think a burglar looks like, right? And everybody yeah. describes the the hat yeah. burglar, you know, with yeah. the the with the mask and the hat and the gloves and and breaking into houses at night and stuff. When you ask the definition of what a convicted felon looks like, it's not Mad McKinnon, yeah, right? And the, so you show right. up to talk to these guys, and the first thing that you get is oh that yeah, wall. So the 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 kind of the arena of how it was set up was there was different desks and it was a mock interview. Okay, so these guys were within two years of getting out mm -hmm. and most of them had been in a long time. I mean, they didn't know what a gallon of milk cost. I mean, it was, yeah, it was amazing when you start talking to them that they've been in 20 years, okay? Life's and, paused. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
when the, the, the format was you sat at a desk, you had a legal pad and a pen, and they put together a resume, okay, mm -hmm. that was part of the class they were taking, and then you were giving them a job interview, and then you critiqued their resume. Now, this is a class they wanted to take. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. volunteer. Yeah. So you would critique their resume and give them feedback after it was over. So what you did is you did a pure mock interview at first. You would do a complete, like they were really interviewing for a job and you were really considering hiring them. Mm -hmm. And then when it was done, you'd break character and you'd say, okay, let's look at your resume and let's talk about what's on here and let's talk about uh, uh, what we can do better and this and that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a lot of, okay, there was two, there was the two things. There, were, there was this, yeah, no, yeah, I don't know. Okay, you had that, and then you had the just motor mouth, just, just, I mean, you know, they're like, almost like they're trying to run a game on you, like they do to each other, and, right. you know, they're, they're just, you know, trying to con you into saying, will you hire me, because I'm the best thing ever, right. you know, and th this was the very first time I did this, so there was just a lot of observing, a lot of, you know, okay, all right. So then when it was done, we got in like a round table format, we pulled the chairs and around, there was probably... 15 of us business owners that were doing the interview. Um, everybody from uh, Pima College executives, uh, hotel people, um, I think there was a couple other restaurant people, uh, Chase Bank was there, you know, so it was these different people. And, you know, I'm also listening to their feedback, okay? You know, the Chase Bank lady is saying, you know, well, you know, what you should do is, and I'm listening to how she's telling you know, a particular person um, what they need to put on their resume and this and that, and, and I'm thinking, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That might work if for a guy that just graduated from U of A, but how is what you're telling him to do going to, how is he going to relate to that? Right. Okay. How is he going to, you know, she's telling him, and I'm just using Chase Bank as an example. I don't remember if it's exactly Chase Bank that was doing this, but, you know, she's telling him, okay, you know, this... <laughs> this 20 year gap that's in your resume is going to be a problem, you know. And, and the guy look she on his relate. face, she can't no, relate. The look right. on the guy's face is like, okay, why am I even here? Why am I even doing right. this? What do I care? You know? Right. Um, and it was, I'm listening to that and I'm listening to, you know, some of the guys tell the people that are interviewing them, you'd never hire me. You'd never. You'd, right. Why am I? Why you're not? You're not why helping. Are you even me. Here? You're not, right, exactly. Right. I'm listening to that because if I'm one of those guys, I'm looking at a bank. Like, why are you even here? Yeah, like, right, right. I wouldn't apply because I know I'm not going. You know, there. they explained to the to the inmates at the beginning of the exercise that this might ne not necessarily be the type of business that you want to go out and interview with. Right. You know, when you get right. out. However, it's good practice. You know, it's good practice because this is a business owner. They interview people. Right. They go through the process. It's good practice. You right. Know. So just yeah. because you're interviewing with Chase Bank doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go out and try to get a job Look for the Chase positive Bank. within Look the Look for experience. the positive. Right. But, but uh, that but doesn't not, work. It's it not doesn't those, work. It's not how this uh -uh. brain works. No, yeah. not at all. Not at all. There's no, because they can't relate to the person that's interviewing them. Right. They don't even know what they're interviewing for. You know, they're right. asking questions like, how do you think you would do at this job? Well, like, how are you going to answer that? Right. Well, I do great, I guess. I don't know. What am I going to be doing? Right. You know, uh, am I a bank teller or am I emptying the trash cans? You know, I just, I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. So we sat around in this round table forum and the feedback's going and, you know, there's people, you know, kind of with their chest out the, the, the businesses, you know, what I see from you guys is that you need to walk the straight and narrow when you get out and. You know, Wrong. don't put yourself back in here. And, you know, they're kind of trying to, like, you know, pontificate this sense of I'm better than you sort of thing. And I wasn't going to say anything. Right. I wasn't, you know, my motivation or my plan was they asked me to come be an interviewer. I was going to be an interviewer. As far as I was concerned, this was the one and only time I was ever going to do this. Right. Um, and I was going to conduct interviews like... I do when I interview somebody. Tell me about your schedule. Do you have kids? Do you have to? What time can you get to work? Do you have transportation? You know the things that I go through when I'm when I'm mm -hmm. interviewing someone, and that's all I planned on doing. But the more it was going around, and I'm listening to what these people are saying, and I'm looking at the guys' faces, I'm like, this is a joke. This is just an absolute joke. And I just couldn't. But being my nature, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. When it came to me, I said, <laughs> we we need to. 
<laughs> well, guys, let's let time let, out. let's talk. Yeah. Time out. Yeah. Time out. And one of them, one of them that was very outspoken, you know, said, "This is a waste because nobody in this room would hire me with my record." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well." I don't know what your record is. I don't know what you were convicted of, but I am a convicted felon also. I own four restaurants, and here's some of the accomplishments I've done. Man, right there, whoop, I had everybody's attention. Right. They were they were locked in, and for the next, I mean, the thing was, it was like an ending, a round table ending of this exercise, which was a couple hours long, and we were probably supposed to sit there and talk for 15 minutes, which turned into an over over an hour session, mm -hmm. and it was almost like all those other interviewers would just shut them out. And it was me talking to these guys, and the educators are just eating this up. Right. I mean, they're just like, oh, my God. We struck gold. You know, right. We struck gold. Look at this. These guys are paying attention to what this guy says. Right. And I talked to them about, you know, me sitting in the uh, parking lot of the restaurant company's corporate office, staring at the uh, rearview mirror, practicing what I was going to say, going in there, not looking threatening, spinning it. Because those are when the questions start coming. Well, you know... I, I got I got convicted of running two thousand pounds of cocaine from here to here. You know right. how do I? Okay, well, was it violent? No. Right. Did you hurt anybody? No. Did you steal anything? No. Okay. You have a drug conviction. Here it is. But here's the positives. And I did. I told them the same thing that I used. Right. You know to 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 get in. So that kind of came and it was over. And man, you know, thank you, thank you, the education department, thank you. You know, this was great and. You know, yeah. would you be willing to come back sometime and this, that, and the other? And sure, why not? It it escalated, and I spoke in front of bigger, bigger groups, and I helped with uh, the baking program, and I helped with the grassroots of the resume writing. Not bring the resume and sit down with an interviewer, but let's sit down. I help you write the resume, right. okay? You know, and this twenty-year gap that you have in here, which you know people are telling you that's going to be your that's going to be your Achilles heel in right. the interview Let's look process. at what's happened I said, well, in those I go, years. I go, what did you do in the past 20 years? Right. Did you lay here on your bed and stare at the ceiling for 20 years? No. What did you do? Well, I got a job in maintenance. What did you do in maintenance? Well, I became an electrician. So you're a certified electrician? Yeah, I got my certificate through a uh, program they have. Well, let's put it down. You know, right. the biggest one that was the, and I could, because I could relate to it, was the food service industry. Right. So the food service program, and you could always tell the guys that were in food service versus the other inmates, because the other inmates usually wore green, you know, green jumpsuits, mm -hmm. green or green uh, like scrubs. And then the food service guys wore white. Hmm. The kitchen outfits were white. Right. Um, and because they have a little bit more freedom than other Right. The inmates, and they can be around different tools, and they can be around different things. So right. they have these white outfits on, so they can identify: Are you supposed to be back there? Or are you not supposed to right. be back there? So, you know, one particular time, I was sitting in a in a session, and we're working through our resumes and this and that, and it was kind of a difficult group, like a little little hard headed. I mm -hmm. mean, a little a little is what you're saying really going to apply to me, right. sort of thing. And I I said, you know. I go, let me ask you something. I said, how many inmates are in this facility? And one guy says, uh, this morning count was 1,500 and something or other. I said, okay, 1,500. And you serve them three meals a day? Yep, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. A busy lunch for me at my busiest restaurant that does five million a year, I do about, oh, 180 to 200 lunches. So you know more about the high volume restaurant business than I do. Well, well what do you mean? Right. You know, your batch cooking to prep for a meal period and service is 10 times what mine is. Right. If you came to interview with me and I was hiring you for my busy lunch, if I was interviewing you for your, my busy lunch period, why the hell wouldn't I hire you? Right. Are you kidding me? But it's just, it's the it's the uh, the system, the way it's designed. Obviously, you have to put some sort of guilt into people that are going through the core process, you know, there's a, there's an act that you committed, mm -hmm. and it's you may or may not understand that what you did was wrong, and the whole process is really built around not only the guilt but the sense of breaking the human spirit, and that's what happens a lot with these people that go to prison is they're damaged human beings, right. and uh, and some of them, some of them are not 
don't even have it in them to understand that there's the life continues just because life does come to a pause when you go to prison. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, I was watching this. I was watching this documentary on a program for people that were convicted of murder in their teens, and now they've done thirty years, so mm-hmm. 30, 40 years of, of sentence in, into the life sentence. So they're in their forties or whatever, forties and fifties. So there's a program that is proposing that, yes, they were convicted of, mur- of murder at 14, 15, 16. They've done 30 years of prison. Can they get out and be part of society? Mm-hmm. And it dawned on me how much life has changed and how life changes around us, and we so quickly adapt to it. So they're trying. this program is, is trying to bring inmates into... Um, into modern society through the use of VR, virtual reality, mm-hmm. and one of the one of the things where it just it floored me was they take this inmate and they take him through VR, they take him shopping, and okay. they take him sure. to the self checkout <laughs> service, and he goes hold up, and he takes this thing out, and he goes, you tell me people trust other people to pay for your, and the ladies like, well you know there's. There's somebody standing there, but yeah, for the majority of the time, that's how society yeah. works. And the guy's like, "What?" You know, um, they get they give them cell phones and they and they show them what Facebook, you know, looks like yeah. and Instagram and what they're able to do on their phone and and uh, and FaceTime and stuff like that. And and uh, and it almost for some of them, it almost brings them to tears, you know, to to see how life has changed so much and. And there's almost that fear. Can I can I adapt? Yeah, you know. Yeah, it you know it became when I was in. So I was in with kind of the core group of people that I, when I'd go back and I'd go into one of these classes and uh, and help teach and help work on the resumes and the baking program is huge in prison. Huge because baking doesn't take any sharp instruments. Mm-hmm. See what yeah. I mean? You yeah. don't need. It's not like the rest of the cooking programs. Baking. Okay, it's uh, it's an oven. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah, answer, it's pretty. Right. It's pretty safe. So they can have inmates, you know, wake themselves up at four o'clock in the morning to go down to the commissary to start the baking for the day, and there doesn't necessarily have to be somebody watching. Right. The, know, the, the level time. of security is the not level yeah, of security, right. Unlike in the kitchen, right, where but there's the knives and right. stuff are behind a chain link. The, the shadow, and the, shadow the outline, boards, yeah, the, the shadow of boards. the psycho butcher knife is right there. Well, not yeah. only that, but if you're going to issue a knife, you lock it onto the table so the, right. the knife right. doesn't get any further than this. Yeah, from you the, got about that yeah, far. You got to, that yeah. much, yeah. Uh-huh. So there's yeah. no... So, yeah. The, so the baking, um, because of the freedom in the baking job, uh, that was like the coveted job. Everybody wanted the baking job. So I went in um, and, and helped, helped with that and helped actually set up a mock restaurant looking uh, back of the house kitchen facility so they could practice uh, orders coming in, tickets coming in, wow. reading tickets from a point of sale system where there's a right. server on the other side banging in an order. And they right. could kind of see this is what, you know, it's no longer scratch on a paper and hang it up, you know, like the short order cook. Now it's computerized, right. you know. So there was that education happening of, you know, this is how we, this is how we, uh, uh, how it works now, how the right. service cycle. So. You know, it was it was good. I mean, it was it was really good. I did that for several years. I was actually the 2007 keynote speaker at the GED graduation at FCI Tucson. Wow. Uh huh. I have a nice plaque. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. And you know, yeah, spoke yeah. and a lot of the people that um, you know I, I spoke in front of there. I had dealt with over the years in the different classes and get ready to get out and this and that. Mm-hmm. And. Um, some of them um, I'd never seen before, never met before, but tried to give them a little history of me and you know how I got here and why I'm talking to you today, and you know the the fact that the fact that okay, yeah, you have this conviction, but you know don't 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 let it you know life didn't end the day you were convicted, mm-hmm. okay, so you've got to you've got to overcome it. And I, I got a positive feedback. I got lots of positive feedback, which is good. It's you know, it's beautiful, man. It's uh, it, I think that it uh, for some for the ones that were listening, for the ones that were willing to uh, to to take in the words. I think it sparks up the fire of you know, because it, it sparks up the fire of getting out there and at least trying, mm-hmm. at least trying, sure. at least taking a swing at it. 
Because a lot of times it's uh, it's it's really that it's over. It's, yeah. I'm, I'm damaged goods. What can I possibly do? What can do? I do? What can I what scratch can, together? Right. And uh, and and you just see it in their eyes, man. They're they're dead. You well, know? like they're broken human beings, and and uh, but also but also find it disheartening how there's little there's little interest on uh, on inspiring people. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't we have a program. To put them in, we have a program to like transition to, it. To, but right. is there a program to to inspire these people? Is there a program to, right. to uh, you know? But it, but it doesn't necessarily. I don't think it just it takes a program. I think it takes it takes individual interest to be willing to inspire others. It doesn't need to be a program. It just needs to be a personal interest on yeah. your fellow human being. Yeah, it's got to kind of come from the heart right. or it's not going to work. Yeah. And and it doesn't like I said, it's just it's just you need to be interested and inspire your fellow human being that might need that, mm-hmm. you know, just um so I I want that. I, I want to see that on each other. I want to see that on 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 more people kind of like being kind towards each other. Right. And, uh, and especially when you know that there's somebody um that has a past and they're a little shaken on, the, on their feet, a little shaken in their mind. Mm-hmm. You know, take take some time, man. Yeah. Sometimes some they just need. Sometimes things. they just need somebody to talk through, uh, right. talk with, and talk through. You know, when I stopped doing this, when I stopped doing this, right. And you know, I had to. I kind of drew the line in a place. So, what you were, you're familiar with the uh, prison complex out Wilmot, right? Okay. That's where I so worked. Right. That's where you were. So, which facility were you in? Uh, Winchester. Is that federal or state? State. State. Okay. So you know the Supermax prison. Right. Is that where you were? Uh, no, this was it was like a medium to high risk, medium but it high. wasn't. Okay. It wasn't like the hard cells, two okay. to three to. So cell. you know that supermax, right. That's out yeah. there, the right. newest complex, the newest one. The, right. Yeah. So I did most of mine at Federal FCI Tucson. That was that was where I did most of my stuff. A little bit with the state, but mostly that right. federal facility. Um, so I was asked, we want you to go talk to the inmates at the state maximum. Right. I'm like, okay, you know, is it the same sort of drill? Is it these guys are within X amount of time of getting out? No. Nope. No. Nope. These guys are not getting these out. These guys probably aren't getting out. Or if they are, it ain't even worth talking about when. Like they're in the middle of it, you know, they've got 20 years to go sort of thing. In a 50-year sentence. Okay, well, yeah. that, that complex turned into it's it's uh, high risk inmates so it's Ooh. child molesters it's mm. it's you know it's it's the bad of the bad it, right. it really is um, you know I, I went and did I did a tour and then I went and did some speaking with these guys but it was it was a different it was a different yeah. I mean you know I walked in and they said you know one of them I said okay there's gonna be a guy in here he's wearing a traditional Muslim He's, he's a terrorist. Um, I, I don't know. He's, prob- to he's probably not going to engage you. Right. But if he does, you know, there was the. I went through the classes with um, uh, whatever the, you know, the the. Who who is it in the prison system that uh, kind of the, the internal investigations investigations yeah, yeah, unit? Yeah. You know what I'm talking uh-huh. about? Yeah, yeah. So before I could do this, I had to go and take these classes with them, right. and I had my own little batch, my own credentials that I got that was mine, had my picture on it and this and that. So, you know, I had to meet with those. I had to renew my certification every year. And, you know, they said, okay, here's, got to watch out for this. You got to watch out for that. You know, I didn't go in there just blind. I was this. Now, when I was going over to the maximum security, there was another class that I had to take. Which was, this are really bad people. These people people will try to manipulate you. Will try, don't tell them any personal information about yourself, you know. This and I'm I'm thinking this is this I, I don't see how I could possibly be helping right you know I mean right. I'm sure there is an opportunity there to help to keep them more I guess civilized in their own environment right but these guys aren't even scratching the surface so what was, was that like when you went in there and talked to these guys it was it was um, they truly didn't listen to a word. Now, they wanted to pump you for information of, yeah, just kind of like, all right, so where's your restaurant? Where do you work? And I actually received a letter that got mailed to me, which I had to turn it in because they told me if you receive any contact from any inmates, 
you have to turn it in. So I received a letter from one of the inmates from that maximum prison. Uh, they, they, they're a little baffled how it got out. But it was, hey, I heard you speak. You know, that's great. I've got this girlfriend, and there's this guy that owes me money. Do oh you think you could call God, him, and man. then my girlfriend could come pick? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, you know, yeah. And I kind of did a graceful bow out on this and right. said, you know what? With that this, group. this is not for me. This I can't. I can't get behind helping somebody, right, right wrong, or indifferent, whatever. Everybody well, deserves I mean, a chance. So the, but when you hear yeah. some of the things these people have done, and they want you to make it easier for them in there, eh, that's not. Dude, for there's me. crimes, I, and I get. I, I, I can. I'm willing to take that time and sit down and listen to, to the people's story. What happened to them? Why they did what they did? A lot of times, you know, theft, mm -hmm. aggravated assault. It's all circumstantial. What happened? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, what you get charged with, it's not necessarily what you did, but it's a plea, whatever sure. it is. Right. But when you have somebody that is convicted of a sexual crime, right? When you have somebody that is convicted of just a blind attack on society mm -hmm. as a as a terrorist mm -hmm. per se, right? There's no redeeming quality no. for that for that person. There's no redeeming quality at all, and there's really no, uh, there's nothing to the story that can say, I get that, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Uh, with with the story of theft, you know, you have a member of your family that is in, in dire financial need because of medical conditions, whatever. All of a sudden, you find yourself with $200 in your hand. You got to make a decision. It was a wrong decision, but, but I understand. I understand. I understand happened. because of your circumstances, yeah. but... A sexual crime. The bottom line I, was, yeah, I couldn't was, walk out of there feeling like, "Hey, maybe I helped like I'm somebody doing something. today." Right. No. The other, the other facilities, I could walk out of there and say, "You know what? I think I, I might have touched some people today. I might have." Right. Uh, and I that's rewarding. Have, you know, this, and that's and that was rewarding. great. Yeah. But on the other side, it was like, you know, I just so that was that was kind of the end of that yeah. that sort of thing. So you know, and everything goes in cycles, and everything you know evolves and revolves and. Um, uh, the restaurant world, you know, we eventually uh, sold the restaurants and, you know, sold a couple, lost a couple, you know, just kind of the restaurant thing is uh, cyclical. You have to have an exit strategy. You have to have a plan. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, there's going to be a honeymoon period. There's going to be a, you know, a town favorite. And then pretty soon the Someone, a new top favorite show. Style. Somebody built a better mousetrap, and now happy hour is better over at XYZ's, you know. So got out of the restaurant world, and uh, a company that I started working for um, way back, kind of in between the going to college to that first day bringing Burger King to my buddy, um, right in there, I worked uh, for a communications company, um, the structured cabling fiber optic cabling, this and that. So when the restaurants were coming to a close, I uh, was doing some sales consulting, working for myself actually, and helping build sales departments, um, different companies uh, as a consultant. And that was good, except I mean, working for yourself, you know, you don't have, <laughs> you gotta provide your own medical insurance, you gotta right. provide, you know, I mean, you're, you're self-employed. Um, just got the opportunity to jump back aboard with this company that I helped start 20 years ago and uh, got back on with them about four years ago now, five years ago now. And uh, it's Arizona Communication Experts and we're government contractors. We do work with City of Tucson and Pima County and all the Air Force bases and Army bases and provide communications infrastructure for them. And again, it was one of those things. I came aboard, okay, a lot of the projects were on. The Employees have to have background checks. Here we go again. Here we go. Let's, Here we let go. me tell you about let's, a little something. Yeah, let's 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 do this. And you know, the group that owns that um, are good friends of mine, and they knew they were they were right there with me as this was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, they were always supportive and this and that. So they knew what my background was. Um, but uh, we we've really done very well with building this company. I mean, from the time we started it, it was four of us working out of the owner's garage. That's it. Going and pulling telephone cable for CenturyLink or whoever needed telephone cable is just contract work. And then I deviated. I did my my path and right. went through bars, nightclubs, restaurants, this, that, and the other. 
you know, come back around. And by the time I got back to them, they went from four employees uh, working out of a garage to over 60 employees um, with all these multi-million dollar contracts and uh, welcomed me back with open arms and said, let's, you know, let's rock it. Let's take it to the next level. And um, I'm now the vice president of the company. And we have a phenomenal team behind us. And now I'm in the contracting world. Now I'm bid, so bidding, nice bidding on government contracts and right. uh, uh, traveling all over the United States. We have jobs everywhere. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's good. Life's good. Well, you have a beautiful story, man. Um, I, want, I just want to put it clear for people that are listening. You talk about how your experience has defined the way you treat people, how Absolutely. you are as a friend, how you are as a as a as a as a as a boyfriend, as a as a father. What does that look like? Can you just what yeah. what is this what you does know, this look like? What if is I hadn't that if I hadn't had the experiences I've had, you know, I've always had a little bit of a temper, okay? And now if I get in a position or a situation where it'd be very easy to flip out like back in the old days sort mm -hmm. of thing, you know, that whole, it's almost like the past, the past 25 years goes tick, 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 tick through my head real quick. And it's like, yep, we're not going to do that. It's better right. just to smile and walk away, you know, so remove yourself. As, right. remove yourself. So as a, as a person, you know, and with any sort of, uh, you know, if, if temper is a flaw, I don't know, you know, any sort of personality traits or this, that, and the other, you know, this is really kind of given me, here's the direction, okay? Here's how you have to, here's how you have to operate as an adult. And then that trickles into, um, you know, being a father and steering my son down, you know, the right path and the whole right from wrong. And, Which and, I really admire the communication and the relationship you have with your son. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's a, you guys have a strong bond, but you're also very in tune with the personality of your son, like yeah. you know what your son needs and how he thinks and he operates. And yeah, I, you know, he, he's. I couldn't ask for a better little boy. I mean, I, you know, his mom and I are divorced, um, which is fine. Uh, he, you know, it led me to my beautiful girlfriend that I love very much, and she is like a second mom to him. And actually, my ex-wife calls her his bonus mom. Oh wow! Okay, I mean, <laughs> look, I, no, I'm telling you, it's the, our relationship. When I talk to somebody and I tell them what it's like um, to have the, be in the situation, like him, they can't believe it. Especially if they're divorced, right. they absolutely can't believe it. I mean, right. um, you know, we raise my son as it's almost like it's the village right. raising this little boy. He has so much love around him, absolutely. and you know, um, my girlfriend and my ex-wife went to the Justin Timberlake concert together. You know, I mean, they they talk about my son's well-being, and you know, she's with him fifty percent of the time. Fifty percent of the time, she's the female figure in his life. Mm -hmm. Okay, fifty percent of the time, um, my ex-wife's boyfriend is the male figure in his life. So, I think it's kind of ridiculous to say. I don't agree with that, and we're going to be enemies, and this, that, and the other. Hey, it didn't work out. Which is easy. Shit Which doesn't is easy. work yeah. out. Yeah, shit doesn't work out, right. okay? And if you can, it, as soon as you're able to shake the ego, right. okay? You shake the ego, and you say, this is for the good of that little boy, right. okay? For us all to come together and go to dinner, or have his birthday party at my house with all of all of the family, all the family, both sides. You know, it's it's for the it's for the good of the situation. And in some weird way, what I went through, okay, where it really tells you that life isn't a it, it, life's not a dress rehearsal. I mean, this is it, okay. I'm 43 years old right now. Um, I'm never going back to 42. I'm never going back to 41. We're moving that way, okay. And if I'm going to spend my life, which was almost in a sense taken away from me. Okay, if a couple things had gone wrong in that whole situation, all right, and it could have gone bad. I could the series of events that could have could have happened uh, would have led me not to meet my ex-wife. Would have led me not to have my son, and things could be just completely, completely right. different. So, you know, in some ways, the way we're raising him is being tailored and guided by what happened to me. 
back when. And when I have conversations with him about right and wrong, you know, unfortunately, right and wrong is not just a black and white statement. Right. There's shades of gray in there. That, and I feel that that's part of like becoming an adult is like discovering those gray areas. Right. When you're a little kid, it's black and white. It's black and white. It's you black start and seeing white. those gray areas as you grow older. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And being able to sit with him and, and tell him, you know, uh, and sometimes I think maybe to my fault, I do this a little too much, but uh, very seldom do I tell him no. And that's because I said so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes he needs no because I said so. But <laughs> I struggle with that. That's yeah, you know, I got to work on that. He's the only boy. I got to work on that. But, yeah. you know, I, I'm more in tune to say no and let's talk about but it. But let me help you understand. <laughs> let, me, let me help right. you understand. Right. Let me help, you know, and with an eight-year-old mentality, a lot of times, you know, let, it, it, I don't want to understand, Dad. Right. You know, I just want to do this. You know, right. So, but I, I think that these past experiences have really helped me be a better father and be able to, you know, raise a little boy under, you know, of course you want to raise him under a certain moral code. Of course you want to raise him, um, you know, to be respectful. And of course you want to raise him, but you also want him to know, okay, there's things out there. There's, 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 you know, unfortunately, you know, the boogeyman is out there. Right. Okay. And you need to be aware of that. Right. Okay. We need to be aware that the world is not completely roses, even at eight years old, you know, um, he needs to start making those slots to file information in his head. Right. And, you know, things, bad things happen to good people. Okay. I still consider myself a good person. Um, and I went down a road that was not good. A lot of it, all of it was my fault. I put myself in those situations, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so he needs to realize that bad things happen to good people. And we do the best that we can with what we have in front of us at any given time. And you need to work through that, son. Right. You need to work through that. When you get frustrated, when you get angry, which he loves to get frustrated, he loves to, you know, stomp his feet and hold his breath and, you know, I'm not doing it and, yeah. ah, you know, just have a total meltdown. Yeah. And I, I'm, more, I'm more apt to help him work through things right. because I want him to know that, yes, you're a good boy and, yes, you know, life's tough and things happen and you got to deal with it and, me just saying no because I said so and sending him to his room, does, is that giving him a chance to work through it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't. That's, yeah. that's phenomenal. But so much of what you described, which it's how, that's kind of how I, I want to end this, is that's, uh, that's what you have such a good uh, a thought process that, that fits so well with jujitsu. Which yes. now you are yes. the morning coach for the 6 a.m. classes here for That's Twin right. Peaks. Beginning jujitsu fundamentals. Come see me. 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Tuesday man. and Thursday. Come see me. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. roll. Yeah. You know, um, I love to teach. I, I love, absolutely love to teach. You know, when I, there was several times that I helped you guys out with the uh, kids. Right. With the kids class, you know, and even though they're little kids and they're running around and they're just, you know. I needed a drink afterwards, but uh, you know, for the it reminds me of that. Have you seen that meme? And it's uh, <laughs> and it's like the shitty picture of uh, of uh, Ben Affleck, and he's just like in the shitty t-shirt. And he's, he's got a cigarette. cigarette. He's, he's like the cigarette. Yeah. And he's like, uh, notice it when you're done teaching class, kids class and you want to go back to being a shitty person. Oh my God. I Dude, need, I need that phenomenal. meme. <laughs> yeah, I need that. You got to find, find I'll send that. It to you. you know, I, I I love to teach and you know jujitsu. Okay, so I think that everybody. You know, everybody has this, well, I don't know everybody. Speaking for myself, I can't speak for everybody. Speaking for myself, you know, there is that part of you that you like to be, you know, you're a male, I'm big, I like to be physical, you know, I like to, you know, you like to wrestle with somebody, you like to see who's... I think it's a duty. I think it's a duty. I think it's as a male. As a male. Okay. You, you could be a... I understand that males have a lot of different roles in society. We live in a society... That because we're civilized, it allows us to explore. I want to be a florist. I want to be a fucking. I want to make pottery. That's fucking great. You still have the duty to know how to protect yourself and protect your loved ones. Your loved ones. Yeah. That's why I'll do self defense for women. Mm -hmm. I won't do self defense for guys. And I get asked that, and and I give them that the, <laughs> the, the, the look with the, 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 the twitch the eye. Bell's palsy twitch that I have. Well, yeah. because so guys will fucking come to me and they're like. Um, well, we were so we were invited to this event at TCC, right? <laughs> and God bless his heart, this this man was 
carrying a purse and he's walking with his girlfriends. Oh, Fucking, I feel, God, God bless his heart, man. God but bless his heart. But he, he, number one, he fucked up coming at me with an attitude. At the end of the day, it was also like we, had, we were like four hours into this, five hours into this thing. And big fucking mistake, dog. When he comes up and he's like, what about guy self-defense? To what my response was, you're a man, right? Learn how to fucking fight. <laughs> and he was like, oh. and he just he stormed away. He clicked his little heels together and stormed away. I don't care about sexual tendencies or what you like and who you would go to bed with. Fucking all the power I love that we live in a society that people are able to fucking come out for who they are and mm -hmm. be who they are without feeling you know fear of prosecution or, or getting beat up at the end of the day you're still a fucking man <laughs> you'll be able to take care of yourself to, yeah. you better know how to defend yourself yeah. period yeah. you have a mom right fucking defend her you have a niece better fucking know how to defend her you know so I agree with you I, I agree that I even I agree that that we all have that, but even if we don't have that, you have to develop it. Yeah. You're a fucking guy. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it could be jujitsu gives you that opportunity. It could be a Neanderthal thought process, but I don't want to fucking a stick primal, with it. Primal, yeah, primal it could be a primal thing. I could be yeah. outdated, but I yeah, yeah. Not that. I mean, you know, when you come into when you come in here, you, know, you walk into uh, you walk into dinner at Applebee's or this and that, and you see the biggest guy sitting at the table, and you're wondering, I wonder if I could pin him to the ground for three seconds. Well, I walk in here and I see the new guy and go. I wonder if I can pin him to the ground with you. I'm going to try. I'm going to you know, try. Just, but, you know, the other thing that jiu-jitsu, most important thing for me, and everybody's experience and journey in the jiu-jitsu world is different. But for me, learning to be comfortable in an uncomfortable position mm -hmm. was huge. You know, you look at these other strip mall type martial art things, okay, which, you know, you can be a nine-year-old black belt if you pay enough money. Mm. You know, um, they have one thing in common, lots of distance mm -hmm. between them. And it's a different world when that distance and somebody's here. And if you don't like people invading your space and being in your bubble, well, hell, this is a real good way to get over it. Right, <laughs> because exactly. That's what they're going to get. You know, that's what it's all about. I mean, it is about being face to face, on the ground, tied up, twisted, um, you know, one of the first times I rolled, one of the first times, the guy that I was rolling with it had been there a while. We go to the ground, he gets on top of me, he gets full mount, he puts his big fat stomach about right there on my, this, mm. and, and just held me there. And I'm like, I gotta get out of here. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm claustrophobic, I can't breathe. Right. You know, this guy, I'm gonna die if he doesn't get off of me, you know? Yeah. And then you fast forward that, you know, I've been doing this five years now, and, you know, my instructor gets on me and feels like a dump truck on top of me, and you got your belly, not fat belly, but you got your belly right here, and you're in full mount, and this, that, and the other. And Which, I'm, in my mind, I do this. I'm about to get mount. I, I do this. You do this. Yeah. I'm like, all right, yeah. I'm going to put all this, because uh, you do know that there's things that you feel where you're like, oh, he didn't like that. He did. Yeah, I'm gonna do you it could, again. I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna do it yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, and you know, you lay there and you go, oh, "This sucks." Yeah, but I'm not gonna die. Right. You know, he, he, it's gonna be over soon, and you've become comfortable in something right. that a few years ago I would have been like, you know, tap, get off me. Right. I just can't. Not necessarily because it hurts, or not necessarily just because that being somebody in your space that close. And that's what I absolutely love about jujitsu. I'm able to carry that on with my. With, with you know, with what I do for a living, you know, I walk into meetings, uh, multi-million dollar meetings with executives of companies and directors of IT departments, and we're going in to pitch a solution for their uh, data network, you know, and you walk in and you've got, you can just kind of scan the room and you're like, okay, you know, half these people are wearing Rolexes and, you know, I saw the... Uh, I saw the Porsches parked outside, and you know that guy looks like he's smarter than Bill Gates. You know, and, right. and, you, and you walk in, and who am I? I'm a, I'm a kid from Benson, Arizona. You know, but I can walk in and go, I got this. I got this, this. is a very uncomfortable room, right? But but I got this. I, yeah. You know, no, it's it's can, it's only be, 
right calm and it's and, and i think it's jujitsu is one of those things that gives you that absolutely 100 percent. that yeah it's a, but you got to have the right mindset i think that you can't keep score in jujitsu no and you can't keep score man because if you're the guy that comes in trying to win every single fight Number one, you're only going to stick to what you're already good at, and mm-hmm. that's not going to lead to to success sure. or to growth. Um, I, I love the fact. I'll tell the story, man. I I love the fact to try new things, and uh, and uh, and to fail. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's a sense of discovery because it now becomes a challenge. Sure. And I love the challenge. There's uh, I always tell the story, right? Yes, I'm a black belt, but there's things that I'm. A white belt that there's new games there's new lapels that i'm trying so i'm rolling with jack mm-hmm. uh little jack the mm-hmm. blue belt yeah. and there's this new sweep that i'm learning this new lapel i just saw it i'm starting i did it maybe like three years ago i abandoned it then i saw it again people had added things to it i was like oh, i'm gonna start playing with this i weigh 230 pounds jack weighs like 170 maybe you know, maybe less than one. He feels feet. heavier than that. He's a small guy. <laughs> yeah, but he feels heavier. Than well, that. <laughs> so I go for my move, and like I said, I'm a I'm a two stripe white belt at this move, and I'm starting because I just saw it. I'm starting to go for it. He dives with kind of like how a how a uh, a rabbit dog latches onto <laughs> uh, to a prey. He latched onto a noun bar that I've never seen from that position, and he tapped me. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, dude, what the fuck? What the fuck? And I and I asked him, I was like, did you see, did you know this move or did you figure it out? He goes, no, I've seen it. And he actually sent me the YouTube video where that armor comes from. And uh, and he was, oh, okay. So then we sat down, me as a black belt with the white man mentality and this blue belt that's showing me something. You know what I mean? And dissected. And dissected, what he, dissected. And then I was like, oh, you know what? If I'm gonna go for this, I need this arm too. Right. Right. And then it right. ends with the with the with the. Uh, it ends with the with the casual, good job, never again. Because that's You're the whole good point. Job, right. You'll never catch me that umbar again. Yeah, sure. It makes me better and it makes you better. You know? Yeah. I, I love that jujitsu is not a, and again, you go back to these other strip mall type martial arts things right. that are if-then statements. If I do this, then you do this. And if right. I do this, then you do this. And if I do this, and I do this, okay, there you got your next belt. Now, right. if I do this, then you do this. And it's too that's many. Goes. And, and, you, can ask, and you cannot ask That's what only going to work right. if the person that you're fighting is on the same page as you. Mm-hmm. Okay, when, you know, jujitsu, there is a bag of thens. Okay, here's the bag of thens. Right. And we don't need an if to go in front of thens. Right. We're going to go at it. And I'm going to start pulling everything out of this bag, okay? Right. And as we move, I've got all these tools that I can use to submit you. I don't have to wait for you to do something. You know, the whole grab my arm. No, the other arm. No, with your other hand. No, your you're, other hand. You're attacking you know, me wrong. You're attacking me you're wrong. You're attacking yeah, me wrong. Sort of thing. When, yeah. I was, when I was teaching the other day, when I was teaching the other day, um, Willie, I was showing uh, escaping, uh, escaping Mount, and he had his leg tucked. And my first gut reaction was to say, well, move your leg out here so I can get to it, so I can show the move. Right. But I stopped myself because... You got to make it happen. I got to make it that. happen if the guy has his leg tucked like that. Right. You know? Yeah. So you, you gain this other way, all these different ways of looking at a problem to solve the problem. And I do it with work because of jujitsu. I do it with work all the time. I go into a situation and I'm trying to sell a project and I can't go when they say this, I'm going to say this. And when they say this, when they say this, no, I've got, I've got the solution and here's the solution. And my solution is going to trump anything they could possibly bring up. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. Sir. Sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We'll have to do it again because yeah. there's so many, like I said, there's so many uh, different facets to your personality and your life. Um, I want to, do another one with you, but talk yeah. about hunting. Hunting podcast. We got to do it. We got to do We're it. We're starting to kind of peak at hunting season. August, late August is my first right. hunt. And uh, I've never gone hunting. Well, we, we talked about that. We'll have, never, to, we'll have to change that. I, I cried when I was a little kid and I stepped on a little crab because I killed something. I fucking, yeah. So, I'm not sure the deer that could have set off. Oh, yeah. He's, so, Jeshua go, went hunting and he, they wanted, uh, they wanted the head, right? So he chopped its head off, and uh, he showed it to me. And like a little kid, I looked at it like a Bambi. I looked at its eyes, and I was like, it experienced pain. 
Yeah. And my own son is like, oh, what a puss. You know, you, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole. There's nothing like your, there's nothing like your son outmanning you. Yeah. There's, really like, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole nother show, you know, sort it's of thing. But because, to do it. you know, yeah, hunting is very, very important, very important to what I'm teaching my son. Right. You know, there's life lessons with hunting, you know, and, and the responsibility of hunting, and the right. responsibility of taking another, you know, an animal's life and taking right. them in the most humane way possible. Um, you know, I have an Instagram. It's uh, AZ Mountain Man, at AZ Mountain Man. Um, and if you look on there, I don't think there might be, there might be a couple, but I, there might be a couple pictures of dead animals. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But there are pictures of, when I say dead animal, I mean fur, head, right. this, the whole grab and grin, you know, sort right. of thing. Okay. But very few, if there, I might have taken them all off actually. But there are pictures of packing meat, of butchering meat, of cooked food, right. okay, that I prepared for, you know, my family. Right. And, you know, that to me, you know, the trophy side of it is, is obviously, obviously. You know, you go hunting, you want to shoot something with the biggest horns or the biggest body or this, right. that, and the other, and it's, you know, this. But for me, you know, showing the pictures of, you know, the work that has to go in after the kill is done and packing out, you know, uh, a deer and butchering a deer and preparing the meat and caring for the meat and making sure that that meat, um, you know, is, is safe and make sure that it was taken care of and this and that. I mean, to me, that's... We need to talk about that. We need to talk about that. We'll that's, do it. That's that's I could talk about that all day. Awesome. Thank you, sir. All right. Cheers.